So, as the last part of this section, I want to talk about chemical methods of microbial control. And um, while probably physical methods are the most commonly used for uh, bulk things, uh, chemical methods are probably the most ubiquitously used. They have uh, a lot of different properties and a lot of different capabilities that we can examine here. So, uh, chemical microbes or chemical methods can control microbes by uh, hydrophobic interactions that disrupt membranes. Membranes rely on maintaining their hydrophobic association with each other, uh, and anything that disrupts that association has a tendency to poke holes in the membrane. They can unfold and denature proteins. Uh, they usually do this uh, by either chemically modifying the proteins. Uh, oxidizing them or breaking bonds so that they're not the same shape anymore, uh, or through uh, hydrophobic interactions uh, that cause proteins to sort of flip, sort of inside out. Proteins are held together by the fact that all of the hydrophobic bits that don't want to be in contact with the water face inside. And if you put them in a hydrophobic environment, then those hydrophobic parts that normally should be staying inside the protein no longer stay inside the protein. So like, just to uh, give you a picture of, of how that works, um, you might have like a protein here, and, and these inside parts here, those are hydrophobic, and this is in a watery environment. But then you add a, a hydrophobic chemical. I'm going to draw this hydrophobic chemical in um, maybe orange. And you've got, so this hydrophobic chemical all out around there. you got more of this hydrophobic chemical around there. And maybe you also still have um, some water. So you still have some water around here, but now instead of being, um, having the inside bits stay inside, it works so that you have that inside bit there is on the outside instead, um, because it no longer has to be on the inside. It's got these hydrophobic elements right here that can make it comfortable even if it's outside of uh, the, the protein. So, um, let's... get rid of this here. and move this back over. So that's how unfolding and denaturing proteins works. Uh, doing oxidative damage to protein or DNA, this is just breaking bonds, basically. You're, you're tearing the proteins apart, you're tearing the DNA apart. This tends to kill the cells. Uh, Cross-linking proteins, instead of like... This is sort of the opposite of tearing it apart. Uh, instead of of taking one protein and ripping it into multiple pieces, you're taking multiple proteins and linking them so that they're all permanently connected to one another. And when that happens, um, they can't be do their normal protein thing anymore. So enzymatic action on cells. This is uh, certainly something that can control microbes in the environment. It's not super frequently used because enzymes are expensive and unstable and um, finicky for different conditions. They're not always very robust, but you do get used to sometimes, especially in like the cleaning industry, you'll see um, cleaners that say enzymatic action and, and sometimes 
that's important, and sometimes it just means that the enzymes are in there, but they aren't necessarily doing anything. And the last one is surfactants. Um, these are going to be things that remove cells from the surface by binding to the cell and binding to the water. So these are the different chemicals and how they can control microbes. Now I want to talk about the classifications of, uh, of these chemicals, sort of what chemical group they're going to fall into. And first is alcohols. These are probably the most common and the most familiar of the, the, the chemical control agents we use. We've all used rubbing alcohol to sterilize surfaces. We've all gone to the doctor and, and, and had uh, uh, rubbing alcohol applied and um, to, to clean a surface. And alcohols are intermediate level disinfectants and antiseptics. They're usually safe to use on human tissue, on skin, um, and they're also used on surfaces. Their advantages are, are a lot. I mean, they're really cheap. Um, they evaporate quickly, so they usually don't need to be washed away. They're usually non-abrasive, non-corrosive. You can use them on most things without damaging it. There's a few, like, delicate rubber parts in some instruments that can be damaged by alcohols. Um, but for the most part, alcohols don't damage things. Um, non-toxic to humans, non-toxic to the environment. Uh, stable storage. Theoretically, I mean, alcohol does burn, so there is a, a certain amount of flame risk, but it's not a huge flame risk, so... Alcohols are, are, you know, very close to the ideal disinfectant. Uh, the problem, of course, is that they're only intermediate level, so they're not perfectly functional in, um, in all circumstances. And uh, there are, because it's liquid only, like there are some things that it just isn't practical to use alcohol on. But it's often the go-to remedy. So it's commonly used in medical applications. Um, it's even commonly used in household applications. I swab down surfaces with rubbing alcohol if I want to get them clean. And alcohol works through disrupting membranes. Alcohol is more hydrophobic than water. So, like... You've got a cell here, and the alcohol is going to associate with the membrane, and that's going to sort of cause the membrane to kind of peel back and associate with the alcohol rather than with itself, and then you'll get sort of stuff spilling out from in here. Uh, in most circumstances, that's the main way that it works. It, it also can uh, unfold proteins. And it does that through um, the same way. It's a hydrophobic interaction. There are, of course, some things that are largely unaffected by hydrophobic interactions. Some uh, microbes resist that fairly easily. Like, they're just well designed to live in high alcohol environments. Um, you know, for instance, like the organisms that live in high alcohol things like strong wine or beer, or, you know, that sort of thing. They, they're going to be more resistant to alcohol, alcohol than a lot of stuff, but usually those are not pathogens. Most pathogens are relatively vulnerable to alcohols. Uh, with the exception of some viruses, uh, some naked viruses, and always endospores. Alcohol does nothing to endospores. But other than that, it's a, it's a pretty good one. So phenolics. Uh, phenolics used to be very common. They were one of the very first uh, standard disinfectants to be discovered and they were used all the time uh, for a long time but they've sort of fallen into disuse 
these days. So these are low to intermediate level disinfectants and antiseptics. More commonly disinfectants than antiseptics, they can be irritating to the skin, um, but they're usually not dangerous. Phenolics are still where you find them mostly used as household applications. Um, surface cleaners, household cleaners, um, household antibacterial, like a lot of the stuff that says antibacterial whatever, antibacterial soap or antibacterial dishwasher fluid or something like that. Um, often that can have phenolics in it and that's what's giving it the antimicrobial action. Uh, they also work through disrupting membranes and unfolding proteins. It's a similar way to the way uh, alcohol works, and in fact, phenolics sort of look kind of like um, kind of like uh, uh, alcohol. So alcohol has got usually a sort of a carbon chain with a an OH group towards the end. So this would be one, two, three. This would be um, propanol, sort of similar to isopropanol, which would be rubbing alcohol. Uh, isopropanol would actually be this. Um, phenolics all have this, what's called a phenol ring, which is a six-member carbon ring with double bonds and an alcohol, an OH group hanging off of it. And this ring here is very hydrophobic. And um, this will be what disrupts the membranes or what breaks uh, uh, the protein apart. Whereas this alcohol here can interact with water. And that is what makes it so that you can mix phenols with water. So that unlike oil... Like oils, you just can't mix with water. So um, it's difficult to use them as an antibacterial because they don't get in the water and so they don't ever mix with the bacteria. This alcohol group here makes the phenols get into a watery solution, an aqueous solution, and that allows them to, uh, to, to interact with the bacteria or the virus or the whatever. And once it's interacting with the bacteria, then the phenol portion can get into the membrane or get into the protein and muck things up. So these work fine in the presence of organic matter. Some chemical disinfectants don't. These do. Uh, and that's an important consideration. Uh, probably one of their most useful and sort of most dangerous parts is that they remain active for a long time. So we talked about um, preservation versus, like, disinfection. And these sort of do both. Uh, if you put phenolics on something, if you put alcohol on something, the alcohol evaporates very quickly. And it's gone. Uh, phenolics don't evaporate very quickly. So you spray them on something or you put them on something, and um, they stick around. They make sort of a phenolic coating on uh, the object that continues to protect going forward into the future. And uh, that's good. Like, they tend to provide semi-long-term, let's say medium-term protection. They don't stick around for, like, months or years, but they'll stick around for hours to a couple of days uh, until they get wiped off. Uh, and, um, that's good, but it means that, um, because phenols or, and phenolics can be toxic, for instance, if you spray something that then gets used for food prep, then, um, the phenolics are going to get in the food, they're not going to have evaporated, they get in your body, and then they can cause damage once they're in you. Not usually severe damage. I mean, phenolics, the most well-known phenolic is Lysol. And this is something that they sell in, like, Walmart. So it's probably not going to kill you easily. Um, though I wouldn't recommend, like, drinking it. But it's not 
a super poisonous substance, but long-term exposure is um, has been shown to be a danger. It sometimes is a carcinogen, sometimes can cause allergic reactions, things like that. And it's um, other than with Lysol, uh, phenolics are not commonly used sort of in the industry or in medical applications very often anymore. So halogens are the last, uh, not the last, but the, the next category. And I've put this periodic table here because all halogens share a particular chemical property. So these over here on the edge, these are the noble gases. They are very non-reactive. They don't interact with anything. Right next to the noble gases, this category right here, or let me just go ahead and sort of circle them. Those are the halogens, and they're only one step away from being a noble gas, and in chemical terms, that means that they are very, very reactive. So, um, fluorine, chlorine, bromine, iodine, and... Uh, I think this here is, um, it's, um, this one up here is almost never used because it's, it's, it's actually very, very rare. Um, and it's too small for me to read easy, so we'll ignore that one. Uh, so those are your basic halogens. Fluorine is also not used very often because it's so reactive that, um, it sort of, it doesn't exist in its raw form. It, it will, it's so reactive that it has, all of it has already reacted. Um, so they are going to damage by oxidation and denaturation, usually of proteins, although some of them are strong enough to rip apart DNA as well. And they're very widely used in a number of different applications. Probably the most common uh, and the most obvious is chlorine. We use chlorine in pools and drinking water. Um, and the chlorine sticks around in the water. And as long as there's chlorine in there, then it continues to have an effect. Uh, the more organic matter that it's exposed to, the more the chlorine gets used up. So the more bacteria it encounters, the more whatever it encounters, the more chlorine gets used up. And then you have to replenish it. So you always have to add new chlorine to the pool every couple of days. Iodine is also very common. Um, chlorine is, while it's not, like, dangerous to get on your skin, you can go swimming in the pool. Uh, you're supposed to go for a shower afterwards to wash the chlorine off of yourself because long-term exposure to chlorine can do damage to your skin and your hair. Uh, iodine is somewhat more gentle than chlorine, and iodine uh, is used in a number of different ways. The first is, so an iodo-4 is iodine in a particular chemical complex that makes it more uh, effective, and iodo-4s are used as a surgical scrub. Uh, if you've ever seen a surgery, this is that yellow, brown, purple stuff that they scrub their hands with and that they scrub wounds with uh, in a surgical room. And um, it's also used in, in commercial food prep. So uh, if you've ever brewed beer or wine or, you know, even done homemade cheeses or anything like that, these are all things that I do, um, I know I've bought iodophor, and iodophor is often what you will use to clean your equipment. You, uh, you scrub, of course, you still wash them, but sometimes there are like little cracks and crevices where bacteria can get stuck. And, um, and in that sort of circumstance, uh, the washing won't get it out. So you leave it to soak in an iodine solution for 10 or 15 minutes and the iodine will kill any bacteria that are left in there. Uh, both iodine and chlorine, I believe, are also used in um, water purification tabs, like the sort of thing that you might buy if you're going camping to clean water that you would encounter. Uh, and uh, 
yeah, so both of those are used in various concentrations. Bleach. Bleach is sodium hypochlorite. Uh, and it is, it actually works through a combination of different methods. But partially it's just chemically reactive because it's got so much oxygen. And so part of it is an oxidative agent. Uh, but part of it is the chlorine in bleach as well. It's a very reactive species of chlorine, much more so than just basic chlorine. So basic chlorine is, you know, fairly safe to, to you know, swim in a pool with chlorine in it. You wouldn't want to swim in a pool with, like, bleach in it. That would probably not work out very well for you in the end. Um, bleach can be very abrasive. It can be very reactive. Some things take well to bleaching. Some things don't. A lot of plastics don't. Um, certainly people don't. Chlorine can be used sometimes as an antiseptic. Not very often. Usually iodophore is used as an antiseptic, but chlorine can be. Bleach is not used as an antiseptic. Um, but we use it to clean everything. Bleach is probably right up there with alcohol as the most common cleaner that we use. And bromine is also used as a disinfectant, but, uh, um, I don't know much about that. I don't think it's very common. Um, so, of these, bleach is the only one that can be used as a sterilant. And that's usually in fairly high concentrations with fairly high uh, exposure times. And uh, all of these are going to be affected by the amount of organic matter. So, uh, if you have cells by themselves versus cells in a very dirty solution, uh, the, because the halogens work by reacting with organic matter, the more organic matter there is, the less effective the halogens are. So, oxidizing agents, we said the bleach works partially like this, and that's true. Um, though we're not going to talk about it again. Oxidizing agents are usually pretty high-level disinfectants and antiseptics, and some of them are sterilants, depending upon concentration and time. Uh, probably the most common three are hydrogen peroxide, ozone, and parasitic acid. Um, you've probably heard of hydrogen peroxide. You know, you get a scrape when you're a kid, you go to your mom, she puts hydrogen peroxide on it. We're going to talk why that's not actually very useful to do, but that's probably most of our experience with it. Ozone, we've all heard of the ozone layer, but we might not know what ozone is. Ozone is a very reactive species of oxygen, uh, and it is used commonly as a, a sterilant or a disinfectant. These work through free radicals, these are uh, unpaired electrons, usually unpaired electrons on oxygen that want to steal an electron from someplace else. And uh, when they do so, they break a chemical bond. So they're going to kill through breaking chemical bonds in proteins and in DNA. They just tear molecules in half. Uh, hydrogen peroxide is the most common probably the cheapest and the most ubiquitous. Uh, it can be used to disinfect surfaces at very high concentrations. It can be used to sterilize surfaces, but it's actually not very effective on wounds. This is because hydrogen peroxide is, is a, a natural metabolic breakdown product of your body using oxygen. So your body knows how to deal with hydrogen peroxide. You have an enzyme called catalase, and you're probably familiar with catalase um, if, if you've been uh, uh, using it in lab, um, catalase tests and whatnot. All aerobic organisms have catalase to deal with oxygen. And what this is going to do is it's going to break down hydrogen peroxide in a safe way. And your cells are just loaded with catalase because they want to protect themselves from the hydrogen peroxide that they normally make. So, in a wound, 
there's so much catalase just from your own body that the hydrogen peroxide that you put in there will be uh, uh, turned into inert gases, oxygen and hydrogen and water. Um, I think mostly just oxygen and water before it has an, a, a chance to do much. I won't say it's completely ineffective, but it's not really more effective than soap and water. So hydrogen peroxide uh, is, is actually not the best thing to put on wounds. Um, iodophore works better. Uh, so does rubbing alcohol. Rubbing alcohol hurts like heck, but it's probably going to be a better thing to clean out a wound with. Ozone. So in water purification plants, ozone is often bubbled through water to sterilize it. Uh, or in, in other applications where you need to sterilize the water, you would also often bubble ozone through because um, it mixes okay with the water, but it's a gas in its normal state. So every all of the ozone, which does not react with stuff and destroy it, is going to leave the water. So it's actually kind of hard to purify water without also dirtying the water. You want to make sure that whatever it is that you're purifying the water with leaves. So you wouldn't want to purify water with uh, alcohol because then you'd be left with alcohol in your water, which, you know, is fun for a while, but I wouldn't want it to be in the water supply. Uh, similarly, like you can purify water with chlorine, that's what we do with pools, but that water is no good for drinking afterwards. It's no good for watering crops. It's pretty much only good for swimming. Ozone, on the other hand, all of the ozone that doesn't get used up right away destroying things, it's a gas. It leaves. So it doesn't leave anything in the water behind it. Uh, parasitic acid is used in specialized applications. Um, it's a sterilant and it naturally breaks down just like ozone and to a certain extent like hydrogen peroxide. So you don't have to wash it off. Uh, and it's very useful for that reason, but it's kind of expensive. Uh, and it's kind of difficult to store, so it's not used very often for those reasons. And uh, something to keep in mind is that all oxidizing agents can be corrosive to some media. Some things are going to take it fine, but some things are not. Uh, especially organic things, like rubbers, some plastics... A lot of those will break down and become brittle when exposed to oxidizing agents. So, glutaraldehydes is the next thing. Aldehydes, um, chemically, they all have a sort of similar look to them. They're a carbon double bonded to an oxygen with a hydrogen at the end. That's what an aldehyde is. And uh, the two aldehydes that are commonly used to control microbes are glutaraldehyde and formaldehyde. Glutaraldehyde is very strong. It's a very potent chemical. Uh, it can be used to sterilize. And uh, it sometimes is, especially with instruments like surgical instruments, that can't be autoclaved, uh, but glutaraldehyde cross-links proteins. That's how it works. So it's going to take, you know, protein A and protein B, and it's going to staple them together and staple that to protein C and staple that to protein D. Um, and they cross-link proteins, and that'll kill cells, and it'll also knock holes in cell membranes. Uh, it kills bacteria just fine, kills fungi just fine. Heck, glutaraldehyde even kills endospores. The problem is that it kills you just as easy. So, uh, glutaraldehyde is dangerous to work with. Like, if you get any on your hands, it's going to kill whatever area that you get it on. And it's even um, volatile, so it'll get in the air. You don't even really want to breathe glutaraldehyde if you can 
if, if you can help it, uh, you usually use it in a fume hood. So that's why, you know, you, 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 that, that's its advantage and its disadvantage. It's powerful, it's dangerous. Formaldehyde is much more mild. Um, formaldehyde does not cross-link proteins, it caps them. So if we have a protein here, then the formaldehyde is going to stick to it in particular places. There, 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 there. It's going to bind all over the protein um, in different places, usually at uh, terminal amine groups. So any amino area on the protein, which you can probably guess there's a lot of because they're made of amino acids. Uh, this renders the proteins useless. It basically denatures them. And uh, it, it also makes them sort of unappetizing to eat, which is why we use formaldehyde uh, as a preservative for dead bodies. Uh, once the formaldehydes got on there, those proteins are... It's difficult to chemically change them for things to eat them, and bacteria don't want to be anywhere near the presence of formaldehyde if they can help it. But um, both of these things, glutaraldehyde more so, but formaldehyde as well, uh, are toxic to humans. And they uh, are also, if not toxic, they're toxic to humans and they are difficult to dispose of in the environment. They're not friendly or easy things to get rid of. So, heavy metals. Uh, heavy metals are sort of of historical importance more than anything else. They were one of the first things that were discovered to control microbes, but they're not used very often anymore. Uh, first off, they're not very powerful. There are low-level bacteria stats and fungus stats. Uh, they're also, you know, toxic to humans. Heavy metals do bad things to humans, especially human neuron development. Uh, you know, we've all heard of lead poisoning and things like that. And a lot of heavy metals are not kind to you. Uh, some of them are actually going to be more dangerous to you than they are to the microbes, because they're not super effective against microbes. But there are a few circumstances in which we use it. Uh, silver nitrate is used as a antibiotic in infants. Uh, it's used in, actually, infants' eyes uh, to prevent gonorrhea infection. And gonorrhea isn't usually an eye infection. It's usually a genital infection. But if a woman has gonorrhea, and she gives birth, as the infant emerges from the birth canal, it gets coated in gonorrhea. And if the gonorrhea gets into its eyes, then that can be a major cause of problems, leading to blindness, possible death, that sort of thing. So usually just as a precaution, uh, all infants get silver nitrate or a different antibiotic in the eyes once they've emerged. Uh, my understanding is actually that silver nitrate is being phased out because it changes the colors of the eyes for uh, temporarily, uh, but I don't know what stage that's at. Copper also is used to uh, retard the growth of algae in pipes. And we tend to make pipes out of copper anyways, uh, so it's more of a useful side effect than anything else, but copper pipes uh, accumulate a lot less algae than plastic pipes do, for instance. In fact, some plastic pipes, the plastic is actually impregnated with copper uh, to help prevent algal growth. And both copper and silver are relatively benign heavy metals for us. Things that are really bad for us are like mercury, lead, osmium, uh, tin isn't awesome for us. Iron is okay, but you don't want too much. So, but Copper and silver are both okay, though not in high doses. Like I said, these are, 
these are not used very often anymore. So surfactants. Uh, surfactants are things that bind water on one side and oil on the other. So they're usually going to have a long hydrophobic tail and a charged head group. And if you think back to like intro biology, that's exactly what a phospholipid looks like. That's exactly what a component of the membrane looks like. And, uh, and they're going to work in a similar way. So usually germs, bacteria, viruses, whatever, they stick to you through hydrophobic interactions. And the, uh, so anything that can be washed off that sticks through hydrophilic interactions will get washed off by just water. And that's fine, you know. All of that stuff goes away, and what's left is what's sticking to you through oil. And for, to get that off, you need soap. You need a surfactant. So just like if you're washing dishes, um, grease, you can't get off with just scrubbing. You have to scrub with soap to get grease off. And what happens is that this part here will bind the grease, it will bind the oil, or it will bind whatever binds through an oily interaction, and it will loosen it, and then this part up here will bind to water and allow that thing, that piece of dirt or that bacteria, to flow away in the water. So, uh, surfactants consist of soaps, detergents, and quats, uh, which are quaternary ammonia compounds, but we're just going to call them quats from now on. Uh, soaps and detergents you're probably familiar with, uh, and they're very similar. Detergents are a type of soap. The detergents specifically have a positive charge on their head group. Um, these are deserming agents. They are not antimicrobials. They do not kill bacteria. They do not prevent bacteria from growing. What they do is they remove bacteria from surfaces. Soaps and detergents are commonly used in the home. They're also commonly used in lots of cleaning applications. Quats are seldom used in the home. Um, they're sort of considered industrial strength, and they're often used in, in medical and industrial cleaning or in sort of professional cleaning machines. They're, uh, uh, they're slightly more dangerous, slightly more toxic, and slightly more expensive than soaps, so they're usually not the sort of things you find in household cleaners, although some household cleaners will have them. Uh, surfactants are useful because they're usually safe, cheap, and environmentally friendly. They work very good at getting rid of microbes, but they are not antimicrobial agents in and of themselves. So lastly, I want to talk about gaseous organic substances. There are some things that uh, can't be cleaned by any of the methods we've talked about thus far. Not a whole lot. But let's say um, pillows or sheets in a hospital. They obviously have to be cleaned. In fact, they have to be sterilized because you don't want to transfer anything from one patient to the next. Uh, and since we're talking about a hospital, we could be dealing with immunocompromised individuals. Better to just sterilize it. But what are you going to do? You can't really autoclave pillows and sheets because the water might destroy them. You can't really dry heat them because that much dry heat for that much time also will probably destroy them. You don't want to soak them in glutaraldehyde because, well, glutaraldehyde is kind of toxic to people. Uh, you don't want to soak them in oxidizing agents because oxidizing agents will tend to destroy most sheets. Um, they break organic bonds. Sheets are made out of cotton or linen, which has organic bonds in it. So, the question is, what are you going to do to clean them? And you've got a couple of options. These are not the only options, but they can sometimes be the best. So, the three main ones are ethylene oxide, propylene oxide, and beta-propiolactone. Beta, uh, These are sterilants because we wouldn't be using them if we didn't need to sterilize something. We've got plenty of good disinfectants. 
They kill by denaturing and cross-linking proteins. And because they're gases, they can get inside of really small crevices, places where you couldn't get with a surface disinfectant. And get, like, everywhere and coat everything. Uh, they're used on objects that are sensitive to heat and water when radiation isn't practical. Radiation is really the other go-to. You could take the blankets and the pillows and you could put them under gamma radiation for six hours. Or you could do an ethylene oxide treatment. An ethylene oxide treatment still is like six to 24 hours. So it's not any faster, but it can be cheaper because you can do it in-house. Uh, usually ethylene oxide chambers are reinforced steel. Um, I'll talk about why in a second. Uh, under, you know, with very good leak-proof stuff, but it's radiation gamma rays get through things. They're not going to be happy if you have a huge gamma irradiation facility in your hospital because, you know, it could get through the walls, it could hurt somebody, um, it's harder to contain. You would need, like, a lead-lined room to do it in. And gamma radiation can be really expensive. Ethylene oxide isn't cheap, but it's cheaper than gamma. Um, the problems, of course, are that they're very, very dangerous. Uh, these are all poisonous, carcinogenic, and generally speaking, highly explosive. Uh, and they have to be mixed with... Uh, in order to work, they have to be mixed with, um, you know, nitrogen and a few other things to stop them from exploding. Um, there have been incidences where, like, they're put in the chamber, but the chamber was improperly evacuated before uh, it was finished, and uh, the, the bedding still had some ethylene oxide on it, and when it was brought out and exposed to air, it, like, blew up, burst into flames. That might be apocryphal, but I've, I've heard of bad situations like that. So these are very dangerous if you don't know what you're doing with them, but they're marginally less dangerous than gamma radiation in some circumstances. And so they are often used to treat those things that are very difficult to clean in any other way. Okay, so last quiz on this section. Which of the following would be appropriate to use on an incision made during surgery? Glutaraldehyde, alcohol, hydrogen peroxide, ethylene oxide, iodophore, quats, lead acetate, or gamma radiation? So I'll give you a few seconds to come up with an answer to that. Okay, so the way to I interpret this question is, since we're talking about an incision made during surgery, we're treating a person. So what we're going to be looking for is an antiseptic. Uh, and so we can start off by crossing off the things that aren't antiseptics. Glutaraldehyde is not an antiseptic. It's not safe to use on people. Ethylene oxide is sort of ridiculous. We just talked about the fact that it blows up on occasion. Uh, gamma radiation. Yeah, you're not going to use that on living tissue. Okay? Quats. Quats are not antiseptics. They're degerming agents. So they're not going to be an appropriate level of control for this circumstance. Uh, hydrogen peroxide. We talked about why hydrogen peroxide is not useful on wounds because of the catalase present in the skin, uh, makes it less efficient. And similarly, lead acetate, lead's a heavy metal, and, um, well, heavy metals are okay disinfectants and sometimes antiseptics. Uh, they're, you know, lead specifically is not something that you're going to want to use on people. We've all heard about lead poisoning. And uh, so heavy metals are going to be contraindicated in this case. That leaves iodophore and alcohol, and I would accept either of these as an answer. 
Now, iota 4 is the answer of choice um, because significant amounts of alcohol in the wound, well, you know, this is sort of a college class, and uh, I think most college students are familiar with the potentially toxic effects of alcohol. Um, certainly, you know, just getting it into a wound probably isn't going to kill you, but it depends on the uh, the circumstances and how much of it gets into the bloodstream. It would just provide a... Uh, an unwelcome variable. And when iota 4 is a possibility, that's going to be the better choice. It's also going to be less damaging to the tissue. Uh, but I would accept either of these, but this is the one I would prefer. Okay, so that's it for uh, controlling microbes in the environment. Uh, and we will talk about uh, controlling microbes in the body coming up.